Member statements? The member for, help me, Toronto St. Paul's. I do not yet know the experience of caring for an aging and dying parent around the clock, working two jobs with chronic sciatic pain while also raising their own child and helping them navigate virtual school. My community member, Deandra, is an essential worker. Her day starts at about 5.45 and, frankly, never quite ends. I don't know when or if she sleeps. She takes a series of cat naps, but most nights she sits at her mom's bedside, eyes firmly on her chest, making sure mom isn't in distress. Deandra continues to wait for a long-term care bed for her mom and hasn't been able to secure home care yet. She is mentally and physically exhausted. Linda was receiving palliative care for her mom, a retired soldier, a veteran through the Lynn. She received financial aid for 30 days to cover overnight home care. Linda's mom survived past 30 days. The Lynn revoked the funding for overnight care. Linda and her family could not afford, on their own, the PSWs they so desperately need. Linda's family, mentally, physically and financially exhausted, without sick days at their disposal. Premier, Deandra and Linda are two families in St. Paul's. There are many others, I guarantee you. They need relief. They needed it yesterday. Dying loved ones do not deserve to wait. To the Premier, will, when will St. Paul's families get access to more home care supports to care for their aging loved ones? Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on Thursday, I will be presenting a motion in the House asking for uh, the government to incorporate violence link training for all current and future police officers. And I just wanted to take a moment to speak about that a little bit, Mr. Speaker. The Canadian Violence Link Coalition was formed as a result of a number of issues brought forward at the 2017 National Violence Link Conference. It brings together allies engaged in anti-violence work with vulnerable people or animals who are committed to advancing awareness, education and training about the link between violence against humans and violence against animals. This issue was first brought to my attention by a constituent of mine, Sergeant Tina Stoddart, who actually uh teaches this course, uh, not just uh, for the Ottawa police, but also across Canada and uh, also uh, in, the, in the United States and elsewhere. And Mr. Speaker, evidence-based research shows violence against animals and violence against people are not distinct and separate problems. Rather, they are part of a larger pattern of violent crimes that often coexist. Partner abuse, gang violence, youth crimes, assaults, homicides, sexual assaults, and child abuse all have high percentages where animal abuse is present. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to speaking more about this bill, uh, sorry, about this motion uh, on Thursday, and uh, I look forward to the debate in the House. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Um, today, I rise to talk about um, our healthcare heroes that we so much hold in high regard. It's been months since both the pandemic um, pay for eligibility, eligibility list and the payments have gone out to these healthcare heroes. And yet everybody, um, constituents who contact my office still today, are wondering why they were left off the list. So, you know, I have a conversation with them and it's truly, I, I have struggled to explain to these healthcare heroes like te lab technicians and DSWs and OR aides, physiotherapists, x-ray techs, cler clerical staff, and many more why, for some reason, they didn't qualify, why they were left off the list, why there's ambiguity around uh, their work and the fact that they're seeing patients and exposed. So even though they do life-saving work, even though they work on the front lines, and even though their jobs were equally important to keep us all safe. A few weeks ago, I raised the concern of frontline staff who had been asked to repay their pandemic pay um, because they were deemed to be no longer eligible, and that's confusing. And these workers, um, you know, they called, they spoke to me, and they said, it's like a slap in the face, you know, and there's such low morale because they were paid, and then they said they were asked to pay it back. The clarity around this government's message was vague. There was a lot of unclarity about who's on the list, who's left off the list. So staff are left wondering why there's some colleagues qualify and why they don't. 
Especially now, Speaker, we're in the second wave. Once again, I call on the government to expand the list and make it retroactive. So give our health care workers the boost that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. Lake Ridge Health and Durham Mental Health Services have taken an important and innovative step by integrating their operations. This partnership, Speaker, will combine Lake Ridge Health's acute mental health and addiction services with Durham Mental Health Services expertise in community-based mental health to create a Durham Region mental health and addiction system. Speaker, by working together, Lake Ridge Health and Durham Mental Health Services can better coordinate services in both community and acute care settings, facilitate smoother transitions, and faster connections to appropriate services, and create a supportive continuum of care for clients for the first time in the region of Durham. Speaker, with the integration now in place, efforts continue in earnest as both Lake Ridge Health and Durham Mental Health staff work together to identify and address existing gaps and develop processes and care pathways to improve care support and services for residents of Durham Region. Speaker, this is an important opportunity to create a truly integrated mental health and addiction system, and by doing so, transform the way these invaluable services are delivered and accessed across the region of Durham. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member from Meshkigawak, James Bay. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. It's a honor for me to talk about the financial situation in my, in my writing. The City Energy decided to close the, the 92 station for natural gas. The city will lose $95,000 in uh, taxing. It's a shame for a city like Toronto. Although the municipality is trying to find a solution day and night, the residents could lose services like child care services and uh, cleaning, the cleaning of the highways. The municipality must provide a balanced budget so that they can uh, provide services for the residents. To, have, to, to not have services to clear highways during winter should not be acceptable. So I'm asking the minister to meet with me so that, so that the people in this city will not lose any services. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Just a couple of things for the record this morning. I'd like the record to show the 21 doctors who wrote to the Premier on September 30th, warning him of the economic and health costs of further lockdowns. They are Drs. Jane Batt, James Bain, Mahin Baki, Marcus Bernandini, Sergio, Sergio Borgia, Peter Cox, James Ducatis, Philippe El Halou, Martha Fulford, Cherie Cater, Stephen Kravchik, Nicole Lasso, Paul McPherson, Neil Rao, Susan Richardson, Coleman Rothstein, Rob Sargent, Nick Vazuris, Thomas Warren, Yvonne Yao, and George Youssef. I would also like the record to show the study published in August 2020 by University of Toronto psychiatrists Roger McIntyre and Yenna Lee that modelled increased suicides in Canada as a consequence of the impact of further lockdowns and unemployment, a tragic social cost not being public publicly provided in data, and I hope the model ends up being incorrect. Finally, I would like the record to show Dr. David Nabarro of the World Health Organization's Special Envoy on COVID-19 stated on October 9th that the WHO does not advocate lockdowns as the primary means of control of the virus, and they are only justified to reorganize, regroup, rebalance resources, and protect healthcare workers, because the consequences are that the poor are made an awful lot poorer. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm honoured to rise here today in the Legislature to talk about an important investment in my riding, which benefits all Ontarians. On October 8th, I was pleased to welcome the Premier and the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade to Oakville to announce that our government is investing $295 million in the Ford Motor Company of Canada's Oakville Assembly Complex. The federal government has also matched our contribution, and Ford Motor Company is investing significant money to retool the complex for the production of battery-powered electric vehicles. The assembly complex has been a staple of my community since 1953, 
and I'm glad to see that the Ford Motor Company of Canada and Unifor have worked collaboratively to reach a deal which will continue the plant's production. Electric vehicles are growing in importance as our country and province look for ways to reduce our carbon footprint. Importantly, transitioning operations in the assembly complex to manufacture green vehicles will strengthen Ontario's economy. These investments have secured 3,000 direct jobs as well as 63,000 indirect jobs from auto parts manufacturers in the province. Moreover, the abundance of natural resources within Ontario, the mining industry has an additional opportunity to provide the minerals needed for car batteries. This investment has made Oakville and Ontario a world leader in the manufacturing and innovation of electric vehicles for many years to come. It's great to work alongside my federal and municipal colleagues, MP Anita Anand and Mayor Rob Burton, to find ways to attract investments for Oakville to benefit the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As we enter the second wave of COVID-19, the people in my riding of Hamilton Mountain are trying to remain safe. As the weather cools and more people spend time indoors, we are all worried about the increased risk of spreading COVID-19. It took weeks for the Prime Premier to finally share his second wave plan, and it's already falling short. One of the major aspects of the plan was providing flu shots. While I've already received many calls about flu shots that have already ran out in my riding. Further, we still have long wait times for, to book a COVID test and get your results. I have heard from many families who are out of work while they're waiting, including PSWs, early childhood educators, and other essential workers. Lastly, when it comes to long-term care homes, we're seeing cases rise once again. We cannot allow a repeat of the first wave. We cannot allow another catastrophe in long-term care. That's why the NDP recently introduced a plan for overhauling the long-term care system. Our plan would add more beds and privatization of long-term care and improve care standards and provide PSWs with better working conditions. The privatization of long-term care has been a disaster. The majority of long-term care deaths during COVID occurred in private long-term care homes. That's because the quality of care has eroded as private operators squeeze out profits. I urge the government to look at our plan to see how they can ward off a second COVID disaster. The member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. I rise this morning with a heavy heart to report a young man, Jag Ran Jag Bar, was killed in my riding earlier this month after being hit by an impaired driver, a man from Orangeville with two prior convictions for impaired driving. Jag was only 19 years of age. Like my son, he was in his final year of high school. His family described him as intelligent, hardworking, with an ambition to pursue a career in writing. The oldest of 15 grandchildren, his sister and cousin looked up to him. Speaker, next month is Mad Canada will launch their annual project Red Ribbon campaign to raise awareness about impaired drivers, which remains the leading criminal cause of death and injury in Canada. I encourage every member to wear a red ribbon and support this campaign because this senseless tragedy earlier this month is a sad reminder of how much work is left to do to put end to impaired driving. I also want to thank the Peel Regional Police for their swift arrest, for their annual holiday ride check, for everything they do to take impaired drivers off our road. I can't stress enough how important it is for everyone to understand that. Choosing to drive while impaired is unacceptable. On behalf of the members, I just want to offer my deepest condolences to Roop, Rob and Sarah and the entire Barr family and to Jag's many friends at Lauren Park Secondary School. May he rest in peace. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Kitchener South Hespler. Thank you, Speaker. This morning I rise to honor an Ontario family who had their world shattered when their four-year-old daughter died last February. This family, despite the unbelievable heartbreak they have experienced, have been tirelessly working to try and ensure that no other family will have to suffer the way they have. I'm speaking about Dr. Jennifer Kagan and Philip Viator. Their daughter, Kiera, was killed in a park in Milton earlier this year in what they believe to have been a murder-suicide by her biological father. Kiera was a bright, full-of-life little girl. I've seen pictures of her smiling and playing with her dolls, pictures with her and her baby brother, 
and one of her holding up a sign on her first day of JK. You can't see her smile because of the sign, but you can see just how bright and shining her eyes were that day. Dr. Kagan spoke to the committee hearings on Bill 207. It is a great step forward for family law here in Ontario, the first changes in decades. As a mom, I don't even know how Kira's mom can even carry on. But while her days are still filled with pain and anger, she's finding ways to speak out in her daughter's memory. She says that Bill 207 makes some much needed changes, that while too late to save Kira, may save another child. Dr. Kagan's concern now is that we need to have judicial training around all forms of family violence so that judges and the judicial branch of the government understand the various forms of abuse and how to recognize them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much.